Mr Mark Reckless. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. We simply cannot afford to agree an inflationary increase to the EU. This country is 13 per cent less income than we had just five years ago. We are seeing 20 per cent reductions to domestic spending. If an inflationary increase is agreed, then according to the House of Commons Library, for just next year, that will amount to £290 million, every penny of which we are going to have to borrow. Now, different members, different honourable members, will have spoken to constituents on different issues. I had police officers who came to my surgery, and they understand that their pay is frozen, they are less happy about changes to terms and conditions, they are less happy about not getting their increments. But what they don't understand is why other elements of the budget, and in particular the European Union, should be guaranteed inflationary increases, let alone inflationary increases all the way through yeah. to 2020. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to do so. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member, for whom I personally have the utmost respect. Does he have the utmost respect for Honourable Members opposite, who voted time and time again to give away our powers and our money to the European Union and now propose to wrap themselves in a Eurosceptic flag and walk through the lobbies with him this afternoon? No, I do not. No, I do not. Sometimes people do the right thing for the wrong reasons. If even the Labour Party are now arguing for a real terms cut in the EU budget, then I hope Conservatives on this side of the House yeah, will do yeah, likewise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well as my police officers, my local council, Medway, Medway Council, of which I was a member, passed a motion. And they asked the members of Parliament who represent that area to vote for a cut in the EU budget. What they said, this council notes with indignation that whilst Medway is facing a massive reduction in its financial settlement, the UK's contribution to the European Union is getting a massive rise. This Council believes the EU should be treated the same as other tiers of government, and in these austere times should share responsibility for public spending reductions. This would allow us to protect local services. I could not agree more, and I will give way. Thank you, the Honourable Member, for giving way. Um, in, I'm proud to represent part of Torbay. Um, how will I turn to residents in Brixham, in my constituency, who are actually suffering an 11% cut in formula grant this year, 6.7% um, and, sorry, 11% last year, 6.7% this year. How will I turn to them and justify that we're going to approve all of the savings that they're making and hand them over to Europe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many honourable members will be asking themselves the same question. We heard from the Financial Secretary as to what these EU officials are paid. The Prime Minister went to Brussels, I think, a week or two ago and said that one in six of EU officials earned more than €100,000. I think the Prime Minister may have understated his case because we need to compare like with like. And actually, not just do they own, earn over €100,000, but they pay a special, incredibly low tax rate just for people who work for the EU. They get an enormous expatriate allowance, which shoves on another 15 to 20,000. They get a huge housing allowance. And every time they have another child, while a group of people in this country are about to lose their benefit of about £85 a month, EU officials get paid tax free another £300 per month per child. They pay virtually nothing in terms of their pension contributions. And if you look at the, the arrangement we have in this country, any public official who earns more than the Prime Minister, £142,500, that has to be signed off by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Actually, if you look at EU officials and say that you had to sign off every time they were effectively getting the same amount, they'd need to earn that Prime Minister's salary here to be getting the same amount of take-home pay they are there, that would be over 5,000 European Union officials. Over one in six European Union officials. The Chief Secretary here would be doing nothing else except signing off those requests. Now, today, we have an opportunity to debate and vote on the multi-annual financial framework, the long-term budget. This comes around once every seven years. It requires unanimity amongst member states, 
and it requires primary legislation in this House to implement it. So if members... I will give way. Thank the Honourable Member very much for giving way. Um, and I wonder whether he would agree with me that despite the, the agitation on his own side of the House, the real issue here is not the objective, because there is a general consensus of the need to, cut for, to, to go in for cuts to the budget. The real issue is the weakness of the Prime Minister in not being able to negotiate and having to put forward a veto. No, I, I don't think that is a, a sensible point at all, because we have a one-off opportunity, and it's this House that ultimately votes. So if any members on this side feel uncomfortable in terms of those not who I am going through the lobby following, but who may be following me in support of my Conservative amendment, I will say to you, if we send the Prime Minister to Brussels telling him that it's acceptable to agree an inflationary increase, he may come back to this House having agreed that inflationary increase, and you, we will then have to vote on primary legislation through committee, through report, every vote for that inflationary increase for the EU budget all the way through to 2020. If you do not want that, then vote today for this amendment. The other very strong argument in terms of this amendment, some people say, oh, well, we're not going to get a real terms cut. Well, we're certainly not going to get a real terms cut if we don't even try. Yeah. Yeah. But if we use the veto, that is not a bad place to be. In many ways, it is better than where we would be with an agreed inflationary increase. And there are two strong reasons for that. One, either we operate with an immediate multi-annual financial framework, which is under the old frozen ceilings carried forward, or we agree new ceilings going up by inflation, allowing higher budgets in the future. Each of those budgets is always negotiated under QMV annually. The question is where we have unanimity, where we need legislation, do we allow inflationary higher limits going forward to 2020 or not? The second point, if there is an agreement... I know, so I, I think other, others may like to come in, if, if you don't mind if I, 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 can, I continue. The, the second point is if there isn't agreement on a new MFF, then we will not see the process continue of money being transferred from the budget towards the new member states. Now, what happened when Labour, in that disgraceful decision in 2005, gave away that rebate is they put in place a process where the new member states don't pay towards our rebate in the way the old member states do. So if the Prime Minister vetoes an MF package, what will happen is that process of money shifting to new member states is suspended. And therefore, the process by which the rebate is given away will, at least for that period, be stopped, which is a significant gain for Britain. If there's an inflationary increase, as the government proposes, we're looking at a net contribution going from 9.2 billion last year to 13.6 billion at the end of the process. We simply cannot, cannot afford that. The European Commission put its own press release out. It asked the question, what will happen if a new MFF is not agreed? The Commission press release states that failure to agree new MFF would considerably complicate the adoption of new programmes. And in the absence of new legal bases, including their indicative financial envelopes, no commitments could be made for multi-annual spending programmes. The 2014 budget would probably only cover the agricultural payments and the payments of outstanding commitments. Organisations benefiting from EU funds would face severe drawbacks. Honourable Members, if you, if you accept, if you are prepared to agree, if you are prepared to vote through in primary legislation later when we get that chance, if you are happy with an inflationary increase in the EU budget, plus everything else that happens because of the continued loss of the, the, the rebate if there is that agreement, then vote for the Government motion. If you think the European Union has too much money, it is budgets too large and it needs to be cut, then support my amendment. Yeah. Yeah.